Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're running all kinds of specials, and you know, every holiday weekend is big for us. Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome to cannabis.net. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on and part of our interview series. And uh, give us an update on what you're up to. Let's start with this weekend. How's life going? And then I got some questions for you. Well, life is going beautifully. Well, it looks like we're going to get a, a, a sunny weekend here in the Bay Area, which is uh, which is unusual. And um, I am really looking forward to a few days off. Now, I got you. What you. Now, when you say off, do you actually get time off? Do you turn off the phone, or do you do you mean you actually get to be with friends and family, but you're always checking the phone? Well, I, I, th I think I will actually get, you know, a couple of days off over the weekend. Uh, the 4th of July is one of the only four days in the year that we actually shut uh, our entire operations down. Gotcha. And uh, so with the exception of, of, of our cultivation crew who's working on plants right now, uh, they will they will have to keep on working on them. Uh, everybody else in the company is going to take a break. So there wouldn't be anybody for me to call even if I wanted to. Excellent. Well, that's always good to take a break. I'm doing the same on the East Coast. So let me jump in with a uh, MRSA question for you. You're, uh, for those uh, listeners and readers that don't know, the California movement uh, is going great, except in the Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act, there is a little interjection about a middleman that you've been very uh, proactive about pointing out. Where does it stand now? And could you explain a little bit where we're at on uh, the legislation? Sure. Well, let me give you a little context, and then I'll give you a piece of good news. Uh, the context is that the uh, regulations, the uh, statewide medical cannabis regulations, uh, which have been finally passed by the California legislature 20 years after the voters told them to do so, uh, they contained a provision which required the use of a mandatory distributor at each step of the supply chain. So in other words, a grower could only uh, uh, provide cannabis to a distributor, um, and then that distributor had to provide it to everybody else in the supply chain. Um, and the effect of that was going to double, triple, possibly quadruple the price of cannabis because there's several steps in the supply chain, and the distributors are looking for 15 to 35% of the value of the goods at each step of the supply chain. Fortunately, um, uh, after uh, a huge public outcry, uh, several excellent pieces of investigative journalism and uh, really hard work on the ground by volunteers from Americans for Safe Access, uh, by some of our paid political consultants, uh, we were able to get those uh, regulations modified significantly. Uh, so we still have the required use of a mandatory distributor, but that is only for the final step in the supply chain. So before a product goes into a retail store, it does have to go to a distributor uh, for quality control and taxation, uh, but that's only one step in the supply chain. So uh, we're, we're counting that as a partial victory. Excellent. And um, it, it will hopefully you know, keep the, the prices of legal cannabis in California uh, affordable. And the general vote uh, right now in California, as you're, uh, you know, have your your finger on the heartbeat, is still in the high 50s for the general approval of recreational. Yeah, you know, we we have an adult use initiative that's on the ballot in California in in November. Um, uh, we've been polling just at around 60 percent, uh, sometimes a little bit less, uh, and uh, and that support seems to be holding quite steady. So we we're we're optimistic. Uh, that that this campaign is going to be successful. Uh, that said, um, you, you know it's it's these things are never a done deal in, until you actually count the votes. Gotcha. Now, it, when MRSA and AUMA pass, how does your life, Steve D'Angelo's life, change six months later? Is it a harbor side doubling of volume, or what does your life look like? And let's say everything goes perfect on the vote. Well, you know, we we uh, believe that there's going to be robust growth in 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 the legal sector of of uh, in the in the legal cannabis industry in California for the foreseeable future, and uh, that's being driven uh, by all of these regulatory changes. Um, uh, we don't know exactly what the relationship between adult use cannabis and medical cannabis will be in the state of California. We're hoping to have a uh, a unitary supply chain, so we avoid the situation uh, that they have in Colorado uh, where you have shops that are divided down the middle with medical on one side and adult use on the other. 
Okay, gotcha. So, but things will obviously grow, and like you said, the expected growth rate on all fronts with approval, uh, not only in California, but hopefully something federally. We'll see what happens. Will be good news, obviously, for the whole sector. Oh yeah, it's going to be good for for the entire industry, and we're on a you know a huge growth uh, curve right now. Harbor side, you know, we we have two current locations. We're opening our third uh, California location uh, in a few months from now. Could be as long as six months from now, depending on the CUP process. We're developing a 160,000 square foot manufacturing facility uh, in Oakland and a 47 acre cultivation facility in Monterey County. So. Uh, we are uh, building out our team and, and getting ready for these new opportunities. Go, going small ball, as we like to say, I see. Really just taking a <laughs> small, uh, small approach, yes. But uh, perfect lead in. Actually, segue to my next question. I want to go over ArcView, and some of our listeners and readers might not know you're the co-founder of the largest investment group generally in, in the industry. Um, Cannabis.net, obviously, a, a uh, is a very hot startup I am also, on a personal note, an angel investor in, in a couple of non-cannabis businesses, as well as full in cannabis.net. Um, we're in a third round of funding. So I've, I've sat on both sides of the table. I've been the guy asking for money, and I've been the guy giving money. What do you tell investors that come to you and say, hey, look, I have half a million, five million, 20 million, and I want to get into this. Where do you, what, what niche within this niche do you like? And, and without naming companies, where do you point them? Well, it depends on what hat I'm wearing. If I'm wearing my Harborside hat, I point them to one of our investments. Okay. Um, uh, if I'm wearing my Flourish hat, uh, then I, you know, I generally, uh, uh, excuse me, when I'm wearing my, uh, my Harborside hat or my Flourish hat, I, I direct people to those investments. Uh, when I'm wearing my ArcView hat, I really I, 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 you refer investors to the ArcView process, which is this really unique uh, process that we've developed. Uh, ArcView does not itself make any investments. We are not a fund. Uh, we don't even tell our investors what they should or should not invest in. Uh, we're basically a matchmaking service. And what we do is we bring investors together with entrepreneurs and create um, uh, environments in which they can get to know each other uh, and, uh, and, and have business discussions and hopefully reach deals. So that, that happens online. So we have weekly webinars. Um, and it also happens uh, in our conferences. So the, the great thing about the ArcView process is that it, it brings literally hundreds of investors together. Uh, they can compare notes uh, with each other. They can uh, share uh, due diligence uh, duties. They can pool their investments. And that uh, peer um, uh, environment, that, uh, that, that um, environment of, of robust collaboration, we found uh, is is something that's very attractive to investors and, and something that's, uh, you know, helped us put $72 million into the industry in the last five years. All right. Well, let me switch hats on you. I asked you an investor-based question. I am a young entrepreneur. Um, Cannabis.net has reviewed and done stories in about 30 startups, you know, kind of giving them some publicity. What are your three bullet points or advice to a young cannabis-based startup that – is it's just getting started without knowing if it's, you know, online plastics, touching the flower. What do you tell young people that come up to you that are starting companies in this niche? Well, I, the first thing that I tell them is, is, is that you do not need to do this uh, uh, tomorrow uh, or even next week. Um, that, that cannabis is an industry that's been around for literally thousands of years and, and will continue to be uh, around for as long as the sun shines <laughs> yeah. uh, on this planet. Um, so, uh, you can, you, 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 there's, there's a feeling that everybody needs to jump in now and get their little piece of territory. What I can tell you is a lot of the people who are claiming territory now are going to be giving that ter territory up in a few years because they haven't thought through their business strategy effectively enough. So number one, educate yourself, come up with a solid strategy. Number two, Make sure that you understand the impact of the law and regulations on your business model. And three, uh, always be ready to pivot. Uh, cannabis is an industry where, like every other industry, every other business venture, having a well-thought-out plan is really, really important, and tracking your progress along that plan is really, really important. However, 
unlike most other industries, um, independent variables can occur with cannabis events that are completely and totally beyond your control, which are frequently unforeseeable until they happen. Uh, they can have a major impact on, on, on your strategy. So be ready to pivot plan, but always be ready to pivot. I love the pivot word. I, uh, I co-teach a lean startup class at a local high school. And as uh, speaking of pivots, taxation, um, Obviously, as the money grows, the governments at all levels will want their share, as well as we, you know, you've been on record, the unions and the middlemen. How does taxation factor into what you're doing and into this industry? And, and, and obviously, it will, it will depress margins, but is it just part of life? Is it the cost of doing business as we go forward? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that you know, paying taxes for the legal cannabis industry essentially is a good thing, right? It's, it's a mark that we are now legal um, uh, and that we have an accepted role uh, in society, so that that's a good thing. But there's some there's there's a, a couple of of huge issues. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, um, Section 280E of the Federal Tax Code, the IRS Tax Code, which considers any organization that distributes cannabis to be a drug trafficking organization, and ha gives the IRS the power to deny any and all deductions um, other than cost of goods. Uh, on tax returns filed by those organizations. So we uh, just got out of court with the IRS a few weeks ago. No verdict yet, uh, but we are challenging uh, that uh, that federal tax provision. Um, it's something that's you know literally a a a threat for every cannabis business in in the country. Uh, it's you know very difficult for any business to survive if you're taxed on your gross revenue. And that's essentially what's 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 happening. So uh, that's issue number one. This issue number two is 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 what I would call overtaxation, or put a little bit differently, uh, putting cannabis in a sin tax category. Sure. So um, you know, Mother Nature was very kind to us with this plant. Uh, she she gave it to us in a form where you know almost anybody can can take a seed and and put that seed into the earth, and in, in almost any environment, you're going to get some kind of cannabis that will grow. Um, and, and, and so that's meant that, that despite there being prohibition and people being put in prison for, for handling this plant, uh, we've been able to uh, grow it and, and get it into people's hands. There's a very robust existing underground distribution system. And that underground distribution system, is, it, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So what we're seeing is as we are getting into in the transition from the underground economy into the legal economy, one of the, the devices that activists have embraced um, and that now increasingly governments are embracing uh, is the idea that there's this huge amount of taxes, tax revenue that can be pulled out of cannabis. And related to that idea, the idea that it's good to put really high taxes on cannabis because then that's going to discourage use. use. And there's, there's actually a, a lot of the taxation policy that was used in, in Washington state was based around the idea that if you make cannabis expensive for, um, uh, if you make cannabis more expensive than you, you then you, uh, reduce the use, especially amongst low people with low education and young people. So the problem with this whole theory is that when you raise cannabis, the price of cannabis in the, in the legal market too much above what it is in the unregulated market, you see massive outflow from the legal market back to the black market. So, the way this plays out in California at Harborside, for example, is every year uh, around harvest time, a whole army of people leave the Bay Area and they go up to the Emerald Triangle and they trim. And they'll stay up there trimming for a few months and then they get paid in cannabis because the farmers don't have any money then. They get paid in cannabis. And so you have thousands of people running around the San Francisco Bay Area all trying to sell cannabis to each other. And, and the price in that unregulated market plummets. It goes down 25 to 50 percent. Wow. And, and, and we see a similar outflow from the dispensary. Uh, those months are always our lowest sales months, always. And that's true across the entire industry. So if you get into a situation where you've got a, a tax increase that's going to that's gonna be a tax increase of more than about 20 or 25 percent on the existing 
retail price of cannabis and dispensaries, my prediction is is that you see an outflow back to the illicit market, and uh, and you make it a lot more difficult for that transition to happen. So the classic example of this was Washington State, uh, where uh, legislators initially put a 25% tax on each step of the supply chain. So you, you, you had this massive, massive increase, and people were trying to sell ounces of cannabis in Washington State for $600, $700, $800 an ounce. Surprise, surprise, nobody was buying. And um, where, you know, at, at one point, shortly after all the licenses were issued in Washington, people had been selling them for, you know, two, three, four, five, six million dollars. They'd been selling off these licenses. Okay. Uh, now people were calling me up and they were, they were, they wanted to give them to me. They're like, Steve, I've got this shop here. It's, you know, it's not doing so well. And I, I borrowed $150,000 to get it open. I need to pay that person back. You know, I, I give it to you if you can just take it over. Um, so overtaxation, the whole concept of sin tax being applied to cannabis, uh, I think is, is, is really dangerous. Um, what we don't want to do is discourage the use of cannabis. Uh, cannabis is not um, like a harm uh, to be tolerated, some kind of small harm to be tolerated. It's this huge benefit, uh, and its use should be promoted. Uh, we know now that in the first 20 medical cannabis states, the rate of fatal opioid overdoses dropped by 25%. And we know the number of lives that, that, that were saved. There 17,000 lives that were not lost because of that, right? So the idea that you make a substance that is actually a life-saving substance into some type of sin tax item uh, and you discourage people from using it by rising the price, is, it's insanity. It's crazy. It kills people. Yeah, I never knew the story of the Emerald Triangle coming back, you know, to San Francisco in that time of year. That's a great nugget that, uh, no pun intended, that uh, that's a really interesting little fact within the, within the industry. Um, on the taxation front and political front, what's your gut feeling on the federal level with uh, President Obama leaving? You know, will he do something on the way out? Will the next president keep it as a chip of goodwill? Kind of what's your, what's your gut feeling as federally? What's going to happen? Well, I, you know, we're seeing a lot of noise coming out of the of the DEA now. Several leaks uh, have come out of the DEA uh, to the effect that they're going to be issuing a new statement on the scheduling of cannabis before the end of August. It, if it's a new statement, it's it's pretty hard for me to imagine that they would not be rescheduling at least to Schedule Two. So uh, that, um, I think that, that there's a better chance of that happening than I've ever seen before, um, but um, we don't know uh, whether it will happen or not. My general view is that um, the, the, you know, the, the quirk is, is, is out of this bottle. Um, uh, the train has left the station. It's not going back in. And even if we have a, a Donald Trump victory, I think that there's, there are enough people in the uh, Republican Party who have already taken an explicit states' rights position that uh, while Trump quite likely will, will slow or, or even entirely stop progress at the federal level, I don't see him attempting to roll back the progress that we've made at the states. Okay. Uh, so I, I still see the feds respecting, more or less respecting, state cannabis laws. Uh, if Clinton uh, gets in, uh, I think that, that, that what we'll see is more or less a policy of benign neglect. Um, I think that she will not do anything to um, slow down reform efforts, but I don't think that her administration is going to do anything to aggressively push them forward either. And it, Again, at the end of the day, I think that, that what we're looking for for the next four years, certainly, is, is that the majority of reform efforts are going to be happening at the state level. Um, I think that it's, it's unlikely that either one of these two presidential administrations is going to aggressively embrace reform in, in the first term. Excellent. Well, uh, so hopefully maybe Gary Johnson sneaks in those debates as well and can uh, can further the movement with uh, his position on cannabis and legalization. Yeah, unfortunately, it's still looking like he's going to have to sneak in, isn't it? <laughs> He'll have to buy a ticket like the rest of us, unfortunately, right? Right. <laughs> um, so your reputation obviously precedes you as, as a tremendous caregiver and your patients um, love you. And your work at ArcView has really moved the industry forward. 
if I go a hundred years from now and we're, and, we're, and we're looking back at Steve D'Angelo's reputation, what do you want to be remembered for? What do you want the first three sentences to be? Uh, I want to be remembered as a guy who uh, insisted that we build not just a new industry, but a new kind of industry, one that uh, incorporates the lessons that this plant teaches us into our business models. Excellent. All right. Well, I'd have to also ask you, uh, you know, just for a personal question, you're on the deserted island. You can only take two strands with you the rest of your life. What, what do you choose? Uh, Granddaddy Purple and Neville's Original Haze. Wow, excellent. Any, any stories behind either one? Is it a historical or uh, go ahead? Yeah, well, Neville's is, is, is absolutely historical. Um, I, um, uh, I, you know, I was fortunate to meet Neville way, way, way back in the day uh, in the early 90s in Amsterdam. And uh, and the the haze uh, that he developed uh, was, is just instantly a one of the most noticeable strains, uh, recognizable strains of cannabis that 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 you will ever encounter. And it's just got this incredible combination of a really biting, um, almost acrid kind of flavor. Um, with a soaring, soaring, really cerebral effect um, that just uh, you know always made me feel uh, super inspired and super energized. So you know that was that was the 1990s, and the, you know the 1990s were at least until 1996 uh, were not a great time for cannabis reform. It was you know it was a time when uh, we were seeing more recriminalization measures than decriminalization measures, and. The Clintons were in the middle of uh, tripling the size of the federal prison system. So um, uh, that haze and the inspiration and, and the energy uh, it brought uh, was something that, that was really present um, uh, for us when we were uh, building Hemp Tour and, and building up the head of steam, which eventually allowed us to, to pass Prop 215 uh, in California. So it was those were the, the glory days of Hayes, and, and, and that's when we sort of kicked off this movement, too. So there's some historical correlation there. And then Granddaddy Purple, it's like, you know, you can't, it's, I love Oakland. Oakland is the city of my dreams, and uh, it's the place that, that allowed me to be free and, 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 and do the things that I've always wanted to do, and and gave me a position of, of honor and respect. Um, and, uh, and purple is, is, is what, is what Oakland is all about. You know, we developed, uh, the purple strains here and, um, and, uh, there's nothing that's quite as soothing for me, uh, after a hard day of, uh, of, of fighting the feds or dealing with the IRS or the Department of Justice of sitting down uh, with some beautiful uh, candy sweet uh, granddaddy purple and uh, letting it soothe my stress away. Yes, I walked right into the next question. What is your preferred method of uh, consumption these days? Kind of where are you at? So I'll, I, I'll typically uh, use uh, prana capsules during the day. Uh, so I generally start the day with 100 milligrams of THC and 100 milligrams of THCA and repeat that dose in the middle of the day and finish off with, uh, you know, a couple hundred milligrams of THC in the evening. Uh, and, uh, and then when I, when I do inhale, I'm either hitting a vape pen, which they generally, to be honest with you, don't give me much satisfaction. So it's sort of if I'm stuck in a conference or a courtroom or something like that, <laughs> then I'll hit the vape pen. Uh, oh, yeah, I've hit the vape pen inside city council meetings even. Um, they're quite convenient, um, but ultimately not terribly satisfying. So I, I also have a couple of dab rigs, um, one uh, that I heat up with a torch, and then I have the vape exhale. Um, and uh, on most days, it'll be, you know, when I get home in the evening that I'll, that I'll hit those dabs, although on some days, like this beautiful uh, sunny uh, Friday, uh, I hit it in the morning. Wow, excellent. It sounds great out there. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's turning in such a great day and a great weekend for you. Um, oh, I won't keep you all day. Curious, you're uh, obviously uh, one of the industry, Mount Rushmore. What do you know that three years from now, Kurt from Cannabis.net and Steve sit down for another interview? What are you going to tell me I knew this was going to happen or I, this, I, I saw this coming? I saw this coming. Uh, you are going to see a more and more sun-grown cannabis. Um, right now, you know, the majority of the cannabis that's produced and consumed in the United States is grown under high-intensity lamps, 
with a horrifying carbon footprint, it takes about 200 pounds of coal to produce the electricity needed to grow one pound of cannabis indoors. Um, and uh, you know, drive 23 miles down the road on the amount of can on the amount of energy it takes to produce one joint uh, grown indoors. So I think that the, and 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 then there's fantastic costs associated with that. So I think for both the environmental reasons and cost factors that you're going to see a lot of cannabis production moving from indoors uh, to under the sun, particularly. Not cannabis that's going to be grown for extraction and, and for infused products. All right. Well, that's excellent to know. Well, Steve, I appreciate your time. I don't want to keep you on this holiday weekend. It sounds like you've already started the uh, the Independence Weekend. I, Cannabis.net users will enjoy this interview, and I appreciate, uh, again, the time and, and taking our call and giving us this fantastic information. My pleasure, Kurt. Uh, very good luck uh, with uh, with your venture, and may all your cannabis dreams come true. All right. Thank you.